Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so this week we're going to talk about the Rococo. We're also going to talk about neoclassicism. We're also going to talk about the Enlightenment and some of the other influences that follow the Baroque period. Um, so first up is the Rococo. Full disclosure, it's probably my least favorite period in art history. So if I seem less enthusiastic, I apologize, but I'll try to get into it. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what leads into this movement. So in the year 1700, um, Louis XIV is still the king of France. He's known as the Sun King. Um, his palace is the very famous Versailles, which has the Hall of Mirrors. Um, and it's very culturally influence, influential. Um, Louis XIV, the Sun King's court, kind of dominates the social scene and the cultural scene at this time. Um, by the year 1800, uh, there's a lot of change that happens. So the monarchy in France is overthrown and the French Revolution. The colonies have become independent from England and is where we come from, America. Uh, there's many revolutions that happen. Also, a different kind of revolution is going on, which is the Industrial Revolution, which starts in England and then makes its way across Europe and over to the Americas. Um, and that also has a lot of influence in basically all aspects of life, right? So we have um, revolutionary change in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the technological arena, um, and we also see transformations in the arts. So first let's look at Versailles. This is Louis XIV's palace that he built in Versailles, France. So he moved the um, palace of the French king outside of Paris to Versailles. So that's the exterior. We can see the uh, resplendent gardens, the very extensive gardens. Um, okay, and then here is an interior shot from Versailles. This is the Hall of Mirrors or uh, Galerie de Glace in French. Um, so this is very important to kind of lead into some of what inspires the Rococo, though the Rococo differentiates a bit from the style. So the Rococo appears in France around 1700. Um, it's mostly an interior design style. That's that's what we mostly associate it with. Um, it spreads into furniture and painting and sculpture and architecture as well. The term comes from um, the French word rocaille, which uh, means pebble. So it refers to small stones and pebbles that were used decoratively inside grottos. Um, so when we look at Rococo, um, interior design, we see a lot of shell motifs and motifs that draw inspiration from shell-like shapes. Okay, so um, let's look at another example of this outside of Versailles. Um, Salon de la Princesse um, is by Germaine Beaufriend with paintings by Charles Joseph uh, Nitois and sculptures by Jean-Baptiste Lemont. Um, and it's at the Hotel des Soubises in Paris. Um, okay, so this is a really typical room of the time. So one of the things that we see um, from the Sun King, Louis XIV, and his people, they kind of set the tone as we're moving into the Rococo. Rococo. Um, but as we move toward the 18th, further into the 18th century, we see that the centralized palace-based sculpture, uh, excuse me, culture, not sculpture, um, kind of becomes decentralized, right? Because the monarchy is overthrown. So um, we see this movement from the grand court life, like at Versailles, to privatized individual homes. And inside these privatized homes, this is the domain of the femme savante, as they called themselves. So this is um, women of the time, uh, aristocratic women, kind of dominated the social and cultural scene in a lot of ways. Um, this was, they called themselves femme savante, which means um, learned women, educated women. Um, so we can see some of the shifts in the design here as well. We can see that Beaufrand softens the hard architectural li lines of um, the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. You see this is a little more linear. We move into the Rococo. We have these very soft, uh, curvilinear kinds of shapes. It seems sort of like the um, architectural elements and sculptural elements melt up into the ceiling. It's very fluid. Um, the paintings in the corners, the corners, it's round, um, are irregular in shape, which is new and kind of strange. 
um, the painting, sculpture, and the architecture all form one piece. Everything is integrated together, right? Um, it always makes me think of frosting the Rococo. So the, the way the plaster is done is, is very elaborate and very full of um, flourishes, right? So we have all these curling tendrils everywhere. There's a lot of um, plaster foliage and little plaster um, putti, little angels and things. Um, the look is feminine and it's kind of a saccharine sweet pastel kind of look and I kind of hate it. Um, but basically, as I said, women dominated the cultural sphere during this period. Um, some examples, we have Madame du Pompadour, which is Louis XIV's mistress. She's kind of the head of the social scene in Paris. Uh, we have Catherine the Great. If anyone's watched the series The Great on Hulu, it's pretty hilarious. Um, so she's the Empress of Russia during this time period. She's extremely stylistically influential. Um, the Archduchess of Austria, who is also the Queen of Hungary, uh, Maria Theresa, she's very influential. So we have um, women in power who like this very feminine, it's kind of like stamping it with the femme savant, like this is designed for women um, in these social flourishes and situations. Okay, so that's the aesthetic. Um, Paris is the cultural and social center of Europe at this time. Uh, women who hosted the forays, um, as I said, call themselves the femme savant, and they are hosting these in their personal homes. So that's that shift from, from the court to the, the home. This spreads throughout Europe. So let's look at a couple of other examples outside of France. Uh, on the left here, we have the Amber Room um, of Catherine the Great. We have a couple of examples from Germany on the right. Um, so this is a, a kind of Rococo spin on the Hall of Mirrors from Versailles, but this is done in Munich, Germany, um, up above. Then below, we have um, from Wurzburg, Germany, another example of a Rococo interior that has all those kind of tendrils and lots of plaster foliage and this kind of thing happening at this time. Uh, okay, so um, an important designer, and he designed the bottom image here. Uh, he designed the interior that was a, a home interior, uh, is Balthazar Newman. Um, he designs, he takes these ideas of Rococo design and translates them into a public ecclesiastical setting. So he takes these interior design of private homes at the time and uses that to influence his design of this church. So we see the same kind of idea, but on a larger scale inside this church. We have the, the ceiling paintings, we have the very um, flourishy, melty plaster work everywhere that's terrible looking but was very popular at the time. We have all kinds of weird marble that doesn't go together. Rococo. Okay, let's talk about painting. Um, so the famous painter who kind of um, set the, the style in terms of painting for the Roco Rococo is jean Antoine. Jean Antoine Watteau. Um, he is known as Antoine Watteau. Uh, so he um, lives from 1684 to 1721. He dies quite young. He's only 36. Um, he's the, the most influential French painter of the time period of the 18th century. Um, and here's kind of Rococo painting in a nutshell. It's about frivolity of leisure, it's about sensuousness, it's about the nature of love, it's about romance, it all has this kind of hazy soft focus look, it's about rich people and their leisure activities, okay? So that's kind of the essence of what Rococo is and Watteau kind of, he invents this basically. So this painting, uh, Pilgrimage to Cythera, he submits in 1717 to the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. So to get into school, kind of like today, um, if you're going to do an MFA or something, you have to submit a portfolio of your work. At this time in Paris, you had to bring in a literal painting or sculpture for them to look at. And they're kind of blown away by this. They, the, the scholars of the Academy have never seen anything like this before. This is the painting he brings. They have to come up with a new category to um, file it under basically. They have to invent a new area of study for him because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, so the thing that they they call this is fête galante, uh, which basically means a gallant party. 
Um, as you can see, the people are dressed in silk and velvet in a very lush, idyllic landscape in the background. It's very glamorous. Um, so this is very new, and it's a weird subject matter to the Academy, but they're into it. They're willing to, to see what this Watteau fella can do. Um, so specifically to this painting, the setting here is the Greek island of Cythera. If you know anything about um, mythology, this is supposedly, according to Greek legend, where Aphrodite uh, was born. So Aphrodite is the goddess of love. She's the Greek version of Venus, right? Um, so she was born on this island. And if you look all the way to the right, you can see we have a statue of Aphrodite here to represent her kind of looking over these um, fancy rich couples that have come to visit her island. Um, growing up her statue, we have pink roses. The blossoms on pink roses um, represent the beauty of love. The thorns of the roses represent the pain and the difficulty of love. So this is all in keeping with her symbolism. Um, so that's, that's kind of thematic of most of his work. We see some portraits of individuals. We see um, some more that are group shots like this, but they're pretty much always done in this kind of style, this kind of unfocused, hazy style with lots of little like um, sort of nods to love and nods to mythology, but it's basically fancy rich people in lush exterior scenes, usually dressed in their very best, and everyone is um, having a great time and, and enjoying being um, rich and carefree, basically. <laughs> Uh, this painting is in the Louvre. It's not very big. Um, Rococo paintings uh, are, are fairly small, uh, especially compared when we look at um, Romanticism later. Um, I actually just read a novel by Hannah Rothschild called The Improbability of Love, which if you like novels that have a little bit of a historical twist, this one's pretty good. It's based on the idea that this um, Watteau painting is lost and then is rediscovered and there's all these contemporary dramas and things that act out around it. And part of it's from the perspective of the painting. It's a very charming novel. So that is uh, a thing you can check out if you're interested in that. Okay, uh, so as I said, Watteau does not live very long. He um, basically drinks himself to death at 36. Uh, he's heartbroken. He dies of a broken heart is how he's romantically remembered, but um, he dies quite young. So even though he's extremely influential, he, he's not that prolific. We don't have that many works by him because he did not live very long. The guy who kind of steps into his spot after he dies and, and takes over as sort of the leading Rococo painter of the time is Francois Boucher. Um, Francois Boucher has helped to his rise to fame and to fill Watteau's shoes because he is the very favorite painting of, painter of Madame uh, de Pompadour, who I mentioned earlier. She's the mistress of Louis XIV, so she's kind of the, the ruler of, of the cultural and social scene in Paris at the time. Um, so he does a lot of similar kind of things in terms of his palette and his settings. He has this very pastel, rosy pinks and light blues kind of look to his um, color choices uh, for his paintings, and he sets them in these very lush, idyllic outdoor backgrounds. He's more direct with his mythology, so most of the figures in his more famous paintings are mythological in nature. This painting, Cupid a Captive, we have Cupid as the central figure, we have Venus above him, um, so this draws directly from mythology, uh, obviously. Um, but basically, uh, he, he is very influenced by Watteau and he wants to emulate him because he wants to become quite famous like he was. Um, he also is a, an educated painter. He knows about the styles and techniques of the Baroque. And we can see he uses some Baroque techniques here, right? So he has this very kind of uh, geometric pyramid-like um, composition that we see uh, in the Baroque period. He has very strong diagonal lines that direct our eye up and around different parts of the uh, canvas. But instead of the intense drama of the, of the Baroque, I mean, think back to Caravaggio and Gidaleschi, we don't have anyone chopping anyone's head off here, right? We have this very, he sort of distills these compositional ideas into this very sensual playfulness that's, that's very relaxed. So he's using technical things he learned from the Baroque to make the composition strong, but it's very um, kind of chill and pleasant, right? Okay. 
Uh, it's a pyramid of rosy pink flush, basically. <laughs> okay, uh, the last thing we're going to look at from the Rococo uh, is this painting, which if you know one painting from the Rococo, you probably know this one. It is a very famous painting. It is called The Swing. It is by Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Um, he did several versions of this, but this is the most famous one. Um, so he was a student of uh, Boucher, the last painter we were looking at. This is uh, Fragonard is his student. He's his most successful student. Um, and he produces this painting, which is one of the most famous of the time. Again, it has that same kind of um, palette that is introduced by Watteau. Uh, so we have the rosy pink in the middle. We have the blues and greens that are very soft in the lush kind of background. We have um, this idyllic outdoor setting. We have a very finely dressed, very richly dressed um, central woman as the figure. She's kicking off her shoe toward Cupid. We have a statue of Cupid with his finger to his lips in the, in the, um, on the left uh, that she, with the line of her body and her shoe, is pointing us directly towards. So maybe this is a secret affair. Maybe that's why Cupid is, ha has his finger to his lips to be silent. Um, her lover is this man who is also the patron who is in the lower left corner. He has somehow convinced this older man who's in the right to push her on the swing toward him. We don't know the whole story here, but it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting painting. The, the more you kind of look at it and look at the little details and intricacies here. Okay, so that was fairly short. That is the Rococo. Um, we will talk about neoclassicism next.